Got myself some wisdom from a leather bag book. Got myself a savior when I took a second Pages, and what did I find? A black and white portrait of a king who's a friend of mine. Funny how when you think you're right, everybody else must be wrong. Till someone with fool's wisdom somehow comes along. His voice was strange and the words he said I didn't quite understand. Yet I knew that he was speaking right by the leatherback book in his hand. Hey. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash of Morio Ministries, coming to you on RTN Christian TV and Radio. RTN is, of course, based in Scotland, but it's from Scotland, Britain, and to the world. Thank you for joining us on Word for the Weekend. Uh, I'm in the United States at the moment. I'm in New York City, my native New York. Um, so we are pre recording. Uh, and I'll be addressing a subject we've already addressed on our Moriel Ministries format on Moriel TV, but I thought it's necessary to bring an exegetical approach to this current problem that is taking place among many believers. And uh, sincere believers are being misled into things that are just beyond the pale with regards to the return of Jesus. So I'll be addressing that now. We've warned for some time that although we disagreed with our traditional pre-tribulation brethren as to the timing of the rapture, we of course agreed with them that there is a rapture. We simply disagreed as to its timing. And we always said that this is a matter for discussion. It's an important matter for discussion, for prayer, for theological symposiums for whatever we're in favor of any kind of forum discussion symposium even even debate possibly but certainly not division or contention those who say there is no rapture are one thing they are people who are teaching error but we accept the fact that there are godly people who believe in the rapture who do not place it at the same time I have never believed in pre-tribulationism, but certainly probably half of my friends, my Christian friends have, probably half. Long discussions, 
no arguments, but things have begun to change. It's an important issue. It's something that needs to be looked at. Now, as I've said before, and I'm not the only one, I would love to be proved wrong. I would love to be proved wrong. But I'm absolutely convinced I'm not wrong. The rapture takes place between the sixth and seventh seals. I've always believed that. The identity of the ultimate antichrist and false prophet must, must be divulged by the Holy Spirit to the faithful church. The abomination of desolation, Hashikutsu Meshemem, must be set up in the tribulational temple. These things must take place. Uh, the rapture being between the sixth and seventh seal. Now, we've gone on about this. Part of the problem is different people mean different things by the same terms. Unfortunately, as we've said many times, that without biblical warrant, too many Christians say the tribulation is the full seven years, and they make the term for wrath, or gay, the same as the term for tribulation, thalipsis, or megathalipson. They say they mean the same thing. They're simply synonyms. They are not the same thing. We are not appointed unto wrath. Wrath comes from God. It's God's judgment against the kingdom of Antichrist, essentially. We are not appointed to wrath. But believers have always suffered tribulation, and there will be a great tribulation. And Jesus made it crystally clear, crystally clear, speaking in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Then he refers to Joel's prophecy, the sun will be darkened, the moon not give its light, and the stars fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky in power with great glory. And he'll send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. The early Christians never believed in a pre-tribulational rapture. We know from the writings of the pre-Nicene church fathers who were closest to the apostles, particularly from Irenaeus, but from others, Hegesippus and Papias and so forth, the consensus was never a pre-trib rapture. Now, that does not mean there wasn't one. It just means that they didn't say there was one. However, Irenaeus got his doctrine from the apostle John who authored the book of Revelation. That makes it different. It was not the teaching of the apostles. It was not the teaching of the apostles. This does mean something. The idea of pre-tribulationism is essentially something that came from the 19th century. It is most associated with John Nelson Darby. The idea of a secret rapture preceded him. It came from uh, Margaret MacDonald and from the Irvinites. But the rapture is only secret in that we don't know the day or the hour. When it happens, it's not going to be some great secret. It's a secret as to when it will happen. Now, let's go further with this. The early Christians did not believe it. John Nelson Darby invented it. John Nelson Darby was a hyper-dispensationalist. Let me explain hyper-dispensationalism to those who don't know it. Most of our regular people, of course, do. Hyperdispensationalists take on the hermeneutics, the method of interpreting the scriptures, from an ancient sect of heretics called the Marcionites. The Marcionites. Now, the Marcionites had a false Christology. They believed false things about Jesus and the Trinity. Hyperdispensational Christians do not take on the heretical. Christology of the Marcionites, but they do take on the hermeneutics of the Marcionites with this radical distinction between the Old and New Testament, a radical distinction, not between the covenants themselves, 
they get it convoluted. John Nelson Darby, the primary father of dispensationalism's view of a pre-trib rapture, was a confused man. He founded a cult, and the cult still exists. They are called the closed brethren, the exclusive brethren. They're a cult. They break up families. He himself did the most un or anti-dispensational thing possible. He believed in sprinkling infants. He believed in infant baptism. Now, there is nothing in substance, theologically, more logically contradictory to dispensational thinking than sprinkling a baby. That is equ equating it somehow with Old Testament circumcision. So although he claimed to be a, a dispensationalist and an extreme one, he still did things that ordinary dispensationalists would think were crazy, such as infant baptism. He was a troubled man in many ways. He had met with this Margaret MacDonald at the uh, power court conferences in Dublin. How much influence he actually got from her is disputed. His father was claimed he got none. However, we do know that John Nelson Darby was a hermeneutical Marcionite. He said, and again, my apologies to those who know this, the epistle of James is in effect not for the church. The epistle of James is part of the Old Testament. It's for unbelieving Jews, because it says to the 12 tribes in Israel. Now, James, of course, was the first book of the New Testament written, and he was writing to Jewish believers who were in the Jewish diaspora of the first century. But no, Darby and his followers say the epistle of James is not part of the New Testament. He also says the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians. It's for unbelieving Jews. Now, most pre-tribulational people already have a problem. They don't agree with Darby. They would say the epistle of James is part of the New Testament. And they would say that the Sermon on the Mount is not only for unbelieving Jews, it is for Christians. But what Darby did with the Epistle of James and what he did with the Sermon on the Mount, he does and did with the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 included. And he would say, Matthew 24 is not for Christians, it's not for the church. This is for unbelieving Israel, don't worry about it. The early Christians never believed this. People who are pre-tribulational, whether they like it or not, are following a cult leader who was a heretical Marcionite. The way he mishandled scripture was heretical. Not just a doctrinal error. He formed a schism based on it. It was schismatic, at Aces in Greek. It was founded by a heretic, by a, a hermeneutical Marcionite, and by a cult leader and a cult founder. His main protege, in the United States was a crooked lawyer who was sent to prison for embezzlement. His name was Cyrus Schofield. Cyrus Schofield had no theological background. He was a corrupt lawyer who was sent to prison. He propagated Darby's ideas in the United States. Even other pre-tribulational people challenged Schofield in the United States, such as Harry Ironside, the great American preacher and evangelist of Chicago. In Britain, Charles Spurgeon opposed Darby, took out ads in newspapers warning about Darby. His contemporaries knew he was somehow crazy. George Mueller, the uh, renowned figure for his very meritorious efforts on behalf of homeless children, impoverished youth. This is a great saint of God, George Mueller. Darby turned against him. Dr. Samuel Tregalis, the Greek scholar, by far more learned than Darby in the Greek scriptures, by far. He and Darby were at odds. Charles Spurgeon and Darby were at odds. He was not a respected figure by most of mainstream evangelicism in his time. And Schofield was not a man who should have been in ministry because he had no moral credibility. 
Yet, somehow, the devil has bamboozled so much of the church into getting so much of their so-called eschatology from these people. That in itself is less than rational, and it certainly spells some kind of spiritual delusion. Why would you look to people like this, who Spurgeon and George Mueller and, and, and Harry Ironside warned against? Why? But they do. Well, let's look even further. A few years ago, maybe within the last 10 years, but particularly in the last five, there was a trend among pre-tribulationists to say something that traditional pre-tribulation believers never espoused. The traditional pre-tribulationists were people who had a message, I wish we had all been ready. There'll be a secret rapture. I wish we had all been ready when it happened. Okay, that was their thinking. In more recent years, people, let me, Thomas Ice and Wayne House in the United States, and others have subscribed to it, some of them shockingly so, that the apostasy, the apostasia in Second Thessalonians is not a falling away, but the rapture. Now, that same word, term basically, just simply a case variant in 1 Timothy 4, apostasy means a departure from the faith, a departure from the truth by those who once held it. The term is not hapex legemini, but they say, no, no, even though Paul is writing both in 1 Timothy 4 and he's writing in 2 Thessalonians 2, he uses the same word to mean two different things, even though they're both talking about the same subject. Now, where did Paul ever exercise that kind of inconsistency in his writing? He never did. It's only in the last few years this crackpot idea has come up. In fairness, there are traditional pre-tribulationists like Dr. Mark Hitchcock, whom I respect, who do not agree with it. They say the word would be harpezo, snatching away, if it meant the rapture, but it means apostasy falling away, a falling away. And we are in an age of apostasy. In an age of apostasy, where we see mainstream, formerly evangelical denominations ordaining homosexuals and lesbians and approving of same-sex marriage, this is apostasy. Whole denominations going this way, including the Southern Baptists of the J.D. Greer, Church of England, whatever. This is apostasy. Oh no, no. The apostasy means the rapture. Well, wait a minute. No, it doesn't. Paul uses the same term talking about the return of Christ as a departure from the truth. Oh no, oh no, it doesn't. Their basis or their pretended basis is the underlying Greek term, ephistomai, which could mean, a spatial de could mean a spatial departure. It doesn't have to mean a spatial departure, but it could mean. Except the word ephistomai is not even in the text. It's not even in the Greek text. This is absolute deception of the devil. It's not even traditional pre-tribulationism with which I respectfully disagree, but now you're just going into full-blown doctrinal error and deception. But now it's been taken a whole other level further of deception by a hyper-dispensationalist called Andy Wood. Also like Schofield, the lawyer, but I do not say a crooked one. He's just a crooked theologian not necessarily a crooked lawyer. Well, what am I mean? What has Andy Wood been teaching? We feature some of what he's saying on the Moriel Facebook page and on our website and on Moriel TV. You can watch him for yourself. But I would just like to exegetically address his arguments for what he's saying. It is unbelievable what this man is saying. 
what he was already saying, that the apostasy is the rapture, was lunatic enough. Now he's gone beyond lunacy. He's gone into something I can only describe as spiritually, as well as doctrinally and theologically deranged. This is deranged. He's as deranged as Darby. Maybe more so. Let's look at what he's saying. Turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I've been reading this very carefully in the original Greek language. I'll try not to bore you with too much of that, but look with me to 1 Thessalonians 4. Remember, we have no chapter divisions in the original Greek or Hebrew canon. So I will begin, please, in verse 13. He's speaking of those who died, that is, fallen asleep, given up the ghost in Christ. Verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. Now, that term hope is elpidon. It comes from the Greek word for hope, but it doesn't mean wish. It means expectation. We have a certain expectation concerning those believers who have given up the ghost. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and this day, we get the word Anastasia, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The Greek word here is keko memenon. I suppose the simplest translation is repose, repose. They've gone into a rest. The scriptures tell us the faithful saints rest from their labors. They did what the Lord wanted them to do. Okay. The only one who dies here is Jesus, apathenon. But the word here for the believers who've given up the ghost is keko memenon. They've gone into a repose. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven, okay, with the shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead. Same basic Greek word, different case ending. Comethentes, comethentes, you get the word coma, okay, like a deep sleep. Comethentes. Now, the word here also is another word for death, necroi, necroi. Notice the word thanos, separation from God. The word for death, meaning separation from God, is not found. We're simply talking about those who've gone into necrosis, the organic decomposition of their, of their remains until the resurrection. Okay? We read this, that the angel and the dead in Christ shall rise, okay? This is in verse 16, okay? Once again, comethentes, but these people have undergone a necrosis. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, raptured, arpezo, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul goes on to relate this to the close of the age when the resurrection will take place and when the rapture will take place. When is this stuff going to take place? He basically is saying in verse 1 of chapter 5, again, no chapter division in the Greek text. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Notice the early Christians understood this. For you yourselves know full well the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Night, of course, corresponding to the period of spiritual darkness 
end moral landslide at the close of the age. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. There are two primary references to this verse. One is in Jeremiah. They say peace, peace when there is no peace. With the advent of Antichrist, there will be a false peace that will come to the world and particularly to the Middle East. He will bring a false peace to the Middle East, the true peace in the Middle East with the reconciliation between Abraham's descendants of Ishmael and Isaac, of Esau and Jacob. That can only come about with the return of Christ. Antichrist precedes him. And he brings about a false global peace, the epicenter of which is a false peace in the Middle East. People will say, peace, peace. You see the world being set up for it now with things like the Abraham Accords. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you like a thief. It should not come unexpected upon unprepared believers. For you all are sons of light. Now, this idea of sons of light as opposed to sons of darkness was a well-known theme, even somewhat among the Greeks, but particularly among the Hebrews. The Essenes wrote about it extensively, as we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There will be a standoff between the sons of darkness and the sons of light. It is also found in Zoroastrianism the religion of Zarathustra, before the enemies of the Persians, of the Iranians, forced them to accept Shia Islam, the original religion was <clears throat> Zoroastrianism, and their thinking philosophically and theosophically was closer to that of the Hebrews, their prophet being Zarathustra. Now, what Zoroastrianism now is something else, they're into fire veneration and all sorts, but in the ancient world, before Islam invaded Persia, the Zarathustrans had the same concept as the Hebrews, the Essenes had it, the early Christians had it, the sons of dark and the sons of light. Okay. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Be alert and be sober. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Now again, the birth pangs is one of many passages in the Old Testament and in the New that will find their climax in Revelation chapter 12. Will find their climax in Revelation chapter 12. Okay, speaking of the rapture and so forth. We are of the day, be sober. Now look what's happening now. Instead of be alert, as we've said many times, the deceiver Rick Warren, who's become the chancellor of Spurgeon's Bible College in London, tells people, avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. Keep away from it. Paul says, be alert. Jesus twice says, be alert. Be alert, be alert, be watchful. No, don't do that, says Rick Warren. People will throw away the word of God in order to read the purpose-driven lie. They will reject what Paul writes. They'll reject what Jesus said in favor of the purpose-driven liar. I'll debate that man anytime, any place about his false teaching to avoid prophecy. He's a dangerous deceiver. Now he's in London. Let's look. The other is sobriety. The prophet Joel said, Awake, eat drunkards, speaking about the last days, the close of the age. The conniver Rodney Howard Brown had a song, Drinking at Joel's Place, meaning the prophet Joel. And they were telling people to behave like they were drunk and they would be on the floor and drunk in hysterics. This goes back to the counterfeit revivals of Toronto, Pensacola, and so forth. Notice the very things we're warned about. 
is what Rodney Howard Brown teaches we should do, Rick Warren teaches we should do. The very things we're warned about, Satan is raising up deceivers in the church, saying, do it. But since we are of the day, let us be sober. And he makes references to something we find in Isaiah and in Ephesians about the armor of God. Verse 9, he's not destined us for wrath. Orige, we are not destined for wrath. But that is not the same as tribulation. Tribulation comes from the devil. God may allow it, but it's from the devil when aimed at Christians. Wrath is the judgment of an angry God. Okay. He's not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. What Andy Wood is now teaching, not only that the, the falling away, the apostasy is the rapture, he's gone beyond that now. And he is saying here that in verse 10, whether we are awake or asleep does not mean whether we are alive when the Lord comes or asleep in the Lord when he comes. He says it doesn't mean that. It means faithful Christians and backsliders. He's saying those who are asleep are backsliders. Now let's go back and look at this passage again a little more closely. Verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 6, 7, verses 6 and 7. Let us not sleep. Okay. Kathe domin. Kathe domin. Okay. Kathe domin. It simply means to nod off, to drop off to sleep, to succumb to drowsiness. It could have implications of sloth but not necessarily. In Matthew 25, verse 5, we see the same thing. Let's look at it, please, in Matthew 25. Concerning the wise and foolish virgins. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. Notice both the wise virgins and the foolish ones. Both the faithful and the unfaithful became drowsy and nodded off. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. It is also a term found in the Passion narrative in Gethsemane, when Jesus rebuked the apostles for not staying awake, for becoming drowsy and giving in to sleep. However, the faithful virgins, although they fell asleep, they were still ready and on the alert. They had oil in their lamps. This, of course, draws on the festal liturgy of Hag Matzot from the Song of Solomon in the temple and today in the synagogue. In chapter 3, she is ready for the bridegroom to come. Even though she's in her bed, she's expecting him to come. In chapter 5, she isn't. This corresponds to the wise and foolish virgins. That's what was going to be read in the temple the following Saturday after Matthew 25 and is still read the Saturday of Passover week. That is the day before Easter Sunday in the Christian canon or calendar, bearing in mind, of course, the Feast of Easter is, is based on a Julian calendar. It's not based on the original Hebrew calendar. This idea of sleep. 
Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That term there, that term is obviously to do with giving up the ghost. Giving up the ghost. That's what it's talking about. Giving up the ghost. Sleep. Okay. The idea is we have to be ready. Work while you have the light. Night will come. No man can work. There's drowsiness. Nothing can be done. We wait for the Lord to come. But the faithful bride, Shulamit, in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, slept lightly with expectation. The wise virgins slept lightly. They had oil in their lamps. They were ready to move. The idea of being alert, being alert. It is not necessarily the dropping off to sleep that is the problem, but it is the falling off to sleep and being oblivious to the reality. Think of people in a fire department here in the United States. Firemen have strange work schedules, and there's a dormitory upstairs above the garage where the fire engines are, and there's poles that they slide down. They sleep lightly. They have their trousers tucked in their boots so they can put them on very, very quickly. Grab a helmet and a raincoat as soon as they get down the pole and they're off in a very few minutes. A very few minutes. They can go from being in bed to being on their way to a fire. It's ridiculous. It's like they can do it within two minutes. They practice it. They train them to do it in the in, in the firefighting academies. They practice it. They're just ready. They sleep lightly. Okay. No man can work. Night is coming, etc. But you sleep lightly and you're prepared ahead of time, just like the firefighters, just like the wise virgins, just like Shulamit in the Song of Solomon. The others are oblivious. They're not alert. They're not reading the word of God. They're reading Rick Warren. It's a diversion. Terrible. This is the devil's work. Well, let's look. Verse 7. Verse 7, please, of First Thessalonians chapter 5. Those who sleep do their sleeping at night. They're not being alert. Um, they get drunk by night. Now, the word there is cathodontis, cathodontis, okay? Same as what was happening in Gethsemane when Jesus rebuked them. Well, let's move down to verse 10. Who died for us, whether we are awake or asleep, those who are awake are watching, watching. Gregor Raymond, Gregor Raymond, they're watching. Okay. Sleep lightly. You're resting, but you're ready to move in a minute. Okay. The others are just out of it. They're again. Catho domin, catho domin. They're out of it. On what exegetical basis can Andy Wood say the following? Who died for us, whether we are awake, whether we are backslidden, whether we are living immorally, or whether we are prepared for the Lord to come and being watchful, we may live together in him. Now with holiness, no man shall see God. This very text in context, the text in context, let us not sleep, but let us be alert. 
Let us not be out of it. Let us be alert. Well, if you're going to be raptured anyway, and you're guaranteed to make it anyway, what do you have to be alert about? It's not even logical. In its exegetical context, it's not even logical what he's saying. It's speaking about those who are biologically alive and those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, given up the ghost. He says, no, it's the faithful Christians and the backsliders. They're both going to be with Jesus, even if they're... You've got these people leaving their wives and their husbands are going off with another man or another woman, abandoning their family, thinking they have assurance of salvation. Now, I'll grant you, some of them may have never been saved to begin with, but without holiness, no man shall see God. Look what the scriptures tell us. What did Jesus say concerning his return? Look with me again, please, to Matthew 24. I'll begin in verse 44. For this reason, you be ready to. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not think he will. Be ready. Don't be asleep. But then he talks about a backslider. Who is the faithful and sensible servant whom his master put in charge of his household to give him their food at the proper time. Those who teach the truth, the word of God to the people at the per correct time before the Lord comes. Blessed is that servant whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. I believe they all have a status in the millennium and they will have an eternal reward on top of their reward for being faithful. But... If that evil servant, an evil servant, now notice he was the Lord's servant, but he was an evil one. If that evil servant says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time. Oh, Jesus isn't coming soon or whatever. And shall begin to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with Drunkards, Proverbs 31, 5 is a reference. Let's look at it. lest they drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of the afflicted. A warning about these who do this. He beats his fellow servants. That alludes to things like heavy shepherding, obviously. And eat and drink with drunkards. Rodney Brown, Kenneth Copeland. The master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know and cut him to pieces, and assign him a place with the hypocrites. Weeping shall be there, and gnashing of teeth. These unfaithful servants, who turn wicked, who backslide, who abuse the Lord's sheep, will be cut to pieces, sent to a place of hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does that sound like they're going to be raptured for a blessing? Well, according to Andy Woods, they will. According to Jesus Christ, they won't. Who died for us, whether we are awake or asleep, whether we have given up the ghost or whether we have remained here, whether we've gone to be with the Lord and our bodies are sleeping in the ground, or whether we are biologically alive when he comes at this terrible time, we may live together with him, be awake or asleep. We are awake, the brethren who've given up the ghost, their bodies are asleep. They are in the conscious presence of the Lord. 
only in eternity. Relative to us, their bodies are asleep. That's what it means. It cannot possibly mean that backsliders are going to be raptured and have the same rescue, blessing, etc. as faithful Christians. This is what this maniac is teaching. Those who are asleep are not the people who have given up the ghost. They are backslidden Christians. That's his exact words. Look with me, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. None of the wicked are going to understand these things, Daniel says. Now look what he says. There'll be a time of distress in verse 1 of Daniel 12. Such has never occurred since there was a nation. This refers to Israel. And at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book, that is the book of life, will be rescued. There'll be a rapture. And there'll be a resurrection. Many who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. In Daniel, in those same terms mean those who have fallen asleep in the Lord or those who are alive when he comes. The rapture and resurrection. Same in the Olivet Discourse, and read in context, the same in First Thessalonians. So the same hyper-dispensationalist who says the rapture is the apostasy, the apostasy is the rapture of Second Thessalonians 2. Now he says, those who are asleep are not Christians who have given up the ghost, but they're backsliders. They're morally asleep, he says. But don't worry about it. They got the same ticket out of here as the righteous. Not according to Jesus in Matthew 24, 44 to 51. Not according to the prophet Daniel, chapter 12. First Thessalonians warns them, warns them. Well, if they have the ticket out of here, even if they're backslidden, what do they need to be warned about? It's not even logical. It's certainly not scriptural. Yet people give him platform. People who I've always liked, respected. I might have disagreed with them on the timing of the rapture, but I otherwise was on the same page with them on most issues. Why would anybody give place to such a crazy man? Why would anybody listen to such a crazy man? And he's crazy. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's not just in doctrinal error. He is a false teacher. He is deceiving and being deceived. Again, the Greek word heresy, heresis, has to do with not just the false doctrine, but being schismatic about it. He is, by definition of Scripture, a heretic. He's a heretic. Andy Woods is a heretic, a false teacher, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And people who should and I think do know better are lending him credence to a wolf, to someone sent by the devil. But that's what we've got. If he or any of his proponents 
wish to debate me on internet TV and a live stream, I will be there. But what he's teaching is a complete lie of the devil. If possible, the elect will be deceived. And some of the elect being deceived, it's unbelievable. Why has my friend Arnold Fruchtenbaum bought into this nonsense? He never believed that the apostasy is the rapture, which he got from the same Andy Wood, a man who says the seven churches are not churches but synagogues. Why would Arnold, a guy I like and respect, I admire his work, he's my friend, I think highly of him. Why? David Hawking, a man who's like my friend and my brother, why would you listen to a man like this? Well, the same reason people will listen to a Rick Warren, avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Unite with Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists to bring in global peace. The same reason they'll listen to Rodney Howard Brown. Don't be sober, be drunk. Each one of these men teach to do the diametric opposite of what the Word of God says. Don't be sober. Don't be alert. I'm confused. But I shouldn't be confused. If possible, the elect will be deceived. How can anybody pay attention to a wolf like this? An obvious wolf. Be alert. Be alert. Oh, no, those who are asleep, those are backsliders, but they're still getting out of here. Don't worry about it. But Jesus said, these unfaithful servants, they're going to be judged in destruction. Don't worry about it. Nothing in the text, in context, or in light of any of the co-texts, from Matthew 24 to 1 Corinthians 15 to Matthew 25, he takes the text out of context in isolation from co-text, and he does it repeatedly. How can intelligent people be deceived by a Darby? Spurgeon warned about him. How could people be deceived? by a man like Schofield. Schofield's ideas were something that engendered a heretic named Bullinger, who again, Harry Ironside refuted Bullinger. Schofield gave rise to Bullinger's theology, and Harry Ironside refuted Bullinger. Trigalus, George Mueller, Charles Spurgeon opposed Darby. How can such a cult leader and a false teacher like Darby have gotten so much following among believers? How could somebody who teaches such conspicuous error, the seven churches or, 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 or synagogues of unbelieving Jews, Matthew 24 is not for Christians, James, the epistle of James is not for Christians, it's part of the Old Testament. How could people believe these people who teach these things? But they do. If possible, the elect will be deceived. If it were not possible for the elect to be deceived, Jesus would not have warned about it happening four times more than he warned about anything else in the Olivet Discourse. Why would you warn about something that can't happen? The elect. Satan is trying to deceive the elect. And he's doing it. The elect are being deceived. 
by the mercies of Jesus. Please, don't you be one of them. God bless.
tears away.